Making up the other two of the three Lords of Sunbreak, Luna Garen and Garangolm are perhaps the two signature residents of the Citadel. Whilst polar opposites in diet, the two fulfil important roles within the lands of the Citadel as its top predator and its chief gardener. First off, a huge thanks to Venomenon for sponsoring this video using the Zora Magdros patron tier. Their kindness in supporting this channel as its top patron can't be stressed enough, so as ever, hopefully it's worth it. One of Lunagaran's more bizarre habits for a fanged wyvern is its ability to stand on its hind legs, and it does seem this behaviour is linked chiefly to combat. After sufficient harassment by the player, or mid-turf war with another monster, Lunagaran will frost up and partially swap to a bipedal stance. This isn't hugely rare among a lot of quadrupedal animals who will often engage one another on two legs and plenty of other monsters will temporarily use bipedalism for attacks. In Lunagaran, the prolonged use of it does seem to come from prolonged engagement, and it never actually starts a turf war with its frosted tips, rather engaging them as combat goes on and being engaged at their latest against Garangol, only when it grabs Lunagaran. This does seem to fit with the law stating that this is from them spiking their internal temperature for muscle usage, although it more seems to reroute the cooling process to the skin to create the ice layer, rather than shutting it down entirely. This may somewhat stem from intraspecific combat between Lunagaran themselves. The pronounced icicles form at their largest on Lunagaran's fin, which may be analogous to the thick, loose skin seen in many carnivorans to protect them from another's teeth and claws. Lunagaran pups are seemingly born with this fin well developed, to protect pups play fighting, but this is also the part where the adults will carry the pups from. So the fins and resulting ice may be to prevent attacks to the nape and back, especially from larger and likely more dominant individuals that would have the advantage of height when rearing up. But this can also have some use when engaging with other monsters too. The full pronation of the wrists that's more rare in fanged wyverns, not being seen in other species like Odogaron or Zenoga, can likely be used for fighting too, but may have some benefits in foraging, digging, item manipulation, or certain prey like mollusks or shellfish, may be best tackled with the long claws and pronated wrists so Lunagaran can exploit a greater range of resources. So long as concept art remains fairly accurate to the animals, we have some info on Lunagaran ontogeny, breeding, and social behaviour. It seems the litter of pups are cared for by both parents at least, and like some other wyverns and most mammals, the young are born altricial, albeit with fully erupted teeth as would expect for animals whose parents don't lactate. Lunagaran parents have the habit of freezing the prey they bring back for the pups to eat, to strengthen their jaws as early as possible. This may be an innate behaviour to develop feeding proficiency quickly in the pups up to a certain age. Spotted hyenas unsurprisingly become more efficient feeders with age and growth, as the larger size allows for a greater gape so they can properly use the premolars and molars closer to the mandibular joint for maximum power, and its suggested frequency of tough food may well lead to greater development of the jaws and bite strength. As the Lunagaran pups become more experienced, they'll develop better technique and stronger jaws in accordance with their growing size, and if their first set of teeth are deciduous, they may lose them in tandem with developing a gape large enough to use the premolars and molars instead. Considering the adults bring food back to the pups, it may be important for them to grow quickly in both body size and jaw power. Enduring as Lunagaran may be, they can't just drag all large kills back to the den. The parents likely have to either select for smaller prey items in this stage, or tear pieces off larger kills and bring them back, both of which will be energetically taxing on them with their need for larger prey. It will be a considerable burden lifted when the pups can eat larger kills, and at least partially follow the adults when hunting. For Lunagaran, especially in the Citadel and Frost Isles, they only have a few short months before Carrion will be frozen solid by sub-zero temperatures. Whilst Lunagaran may still frequently make their own kills, it'd be foolish to avoid such a bounty of Carrion, and pups already able to process large frozen kills will have a strong advantage. Despite being somewhat lupine in inspiration, and at least living in mated pairs to rear the young, like many other large monsters, Lunagaran are typically seen alone, and like many other larger predators in Monster Hunter, they don't seem to pack hunt. But this doesn't necessarily preclude social living, 
With most of their prey being around their own body mass or smaller, and huge prey items likely in its range like Gamoth and Duramboros also being too large for even a mated pair to tackle, there's no real net benefit to Lunagaran hunting socially. Similarly, for most creatures large and hostile enough that they would consider stealing a kill, they're likely not going to be put off by the presence of a second Lunagaran either, so adding a second individual may only have minimal gain. So like a lot of animals, and plenty carnivores like red foxes or brown hyenas, and possibly some other monsters too, Lunagaran may still live socially but forage solitarily, resulting in most of their interactions with hunters being the solitary foraging adults. Whilst Lunagaran is described to live across a wide range of habitats, large water bodies do seem to be a reoccurring feature in them. The Citadel and Frost Islands are coastal maps, and the jungle is on the shores of a giant tidal lake. This is still a wide range of climactic conditions and seasonal ranges as the law state, but the frequency of large water bodies does seem noteworthy in Lunagaran ranges, and this does seem to fit Lunagaran's morphology. Luna has a large finned tail that doesn't seem to have a specific purpose on land, but would make a considerable difference in swimming. Similarly, Lunagaran's notched jaw does seem reminiscent of those of many Piscivorous animals, like some crocodilians, eels, and spinosaurids, so there's some fair precedent here. It's not likely Lunagaran is a purely aquatic animal. From the amount of time we see it on land hunting other prey, the fact it isn't completely adapted for aquatic life or food, and general law not mentioning this. But it may be possible Lunagaran has some divergences that let it dip into both the surf and turf aspects of its habitat and the food it provides. There's a lot of instances of other carnivores doing this too. Brown hyenas on the Namibian coast get all their food from seal colonies, making them a viable population of large carnivores supported entirely by marine resources. Even more relevant may be British Columbia's sea wolves and populations from other areas too. Too. These wolves have a majority seafood diet despite not possessing any major physical adaptations to a coastal environment. And as well as beachcombing, they hunt marine mammals like sea otters and seals and often swim between islands to access them. Whilst they may still sometimes eat deer in the area as well, most of their food comes from the ocean and the archipelago they live in. In the case of the British Columbian wolves, these habitats may have also made them genetically distinct from other wolves nearby too. So Lunagaran may similarly dabble in ocean or general aquatic cuisine. Between gajor, young piscine wyverns, and general species of fish, there's large enough swimming prey to still provide a good meal for Lunagaran in the water. Lunagaran may also be one of the many to take advantage of the mass bounties produced by hermitors by the jungle lake too, even if the armour of adult hermitors may be too tough to get through. Other mollusks and crustaceans may be large and slash or numerous enough to be worth swimming for. And as mentioned before, we know little of what large vertebrates live in the cold water seas. But if pinniped-like animals are available, they'd presumably be a good meal. Slow, sluggish monsters like Tetranodon may also be potential targets, as they forage around the shallow waters themselves. Hunting in and around the water's edge too may be another reason for Lunagaran to be solitary foragers. Most of the things on offer will only need a single Lunagaran to handle them, but with the movements of the tides, many of them may be ephemeral and unpredictable resources, even if the overall foraging area is still rich. Lunagaran may have better luck foraging as single units to cover more ground in such an environment, rather than staying together as a pair. Otherwise, and for more typical and land-based prey, Lunagaran is seen to hunt other monsters, predating an Acnosom in one cutscene and otherwise likely sustaining itself off the local herbivores like gown goats and popo. It may opportunistically attempt with other or larger monsters too, and considering Garangolm's apparently typical gentle disposition, their turf war may be an ambitious attempted predation from Lunagaran. The other chief monster of the citadel is Garangolm. Seemingly appearing as giant, peaceful, promascious monsters, unless infected by the curio or sufficiently harassed, they can often be found resting or browsing in wooded areas. Garangolm excrete a thick, sap-like material from between their armour, that then flows over and settles onto the plating. This seems to have a dual role, one of which being it hardens the plating and makes it superior armour. Presumably the very thick fluid solidifies in either the cooler temperatures, or upon contact with the air, much like tree sap when outside of the tree. 
It may be partially kept on the plates by their microstructure, and the individual hairs of three-toed sloths contain specialised cracks to trap water in them during rainy periods, providing a home for the hydroponically growing algae to then take root in their fur. Garangolm could have a similar thing with its plating, and it could contain microscopic cracks or other features, so the sap and then later plant life sticks to it rather than gradually flowing off, and for a similar reason, to encourage algae and plant growth on Garangolm's body itself. In sloths, it's more believed this may be for nutritional supplementation over the more widely known theory of camouflage. But this seems unlikely in Garangolm with its far greater body size and far lesser amount of homegrown vegetation. For Garangolm, it may be more for camouflage. Despite its huge size, Garangolm doesn't seem to defend itself very well, being trounced by other monsters who weigh considerably less than it. Even if these don't result in predation, with other larger carnivores it could well do so. The sap and assorted vegetation may disguise a sleeping Garangolm if viewed from the air, and it could be the vegetation either masks the scent of the Garangolm, or the sap is repellent to predatory monsters for further protection. Garangolm may never get quite as overgrown as other monsters like Durambaros, due to their primate habit of grooming themselves. With flexible arms and hands, Garangolm can keep most of its body clear, and whilst little is known about its social habits, it's possible some aloe grooming occasionally occurs. The sap itself may also have some role in partially cultivating the environment. While many monsters engage in bioturbation, the act of effectively tilling the soil to fix nitrogen and disperse nutrients, Garangolm's bioturbation may partially sow its sap into the soil as well. This ostensibly encourages plant growth significantly, and Garangolm may naturally deposit more around preferred plant species it often frequents to feed on due to the extra time spent there effectively growing its own vegetable patches of favourite foods. This is already seen to some extent in actual herbivores, where cropping plants can result in nutritious regrowth rather than maturation or senescence, and returning to past feeding spots can yield a bounty of high quality food over unused ones. Whilst there may be upper limits to this of course, it could be that a mix of sap and foraging results in both high yield and fast turnarounds on said yields allowing Garangolm to persist in lower productivity forests or have smaller territories than other herbivores. We can even suggest that Garangolm secretes more sap in preferred or productive feeding spots to encourage swift regrowth too. Much like a gorilla too, Garangolm shows clear adaptations for both herbivory and folivory as well. Noticeable is Garangolm's large, barrel-like gut often seen in many herbivores, suggesting Garangolm is a hindgut fermenter as would expect for such a large herbivore, and one with a more fibrous diet. This allows for long retention and absorption times, so whatever Garangolm eats likely stays in him for some time. Underneath all his plating, Garangolm possesses a robust jaw and skull, with likely a high bite force too to deal with the tough plant matter. Like mountain gorillas who eat far more fibre and leaves than fruits, it likely has more robust, worn teeth to do so with greater amounts of dentine or dentine equivalents to help it process such tough food reliably over a long lifespan. Compared to other herbivorous primates in Monster Hunter, Garangolm has the most northerly range with it reaching the snow line, and this is likely supported by this diet. Whilst both Bishoten and Kongalala will live in fairly cool environments, like swamps or the bamboo forests around Kamora, neither get to similar biomes like Garangolm, and likely due to their less enduring diet. Bishoten seems to mainly be a frugivore, and Kongalala something of a generalist with a preference for fruit and fungi. And so in the more boreal forests, it could be there aren't sufficient permanent crops of their preferred foods to support them. And like the purely herbivorous Garangolm, Garangolm likely represents the most northerly range for a large herbivorous primate before they either have to downsize considerably like the pearl spring macaques, or become more carnivorous like Blangonga or Rajang. It's unknown if the Garangolm we fight, like many other primates in Monster Hunter, are all males as is the case with Rajang, Bishoten, Kongalala, and Blangonga. Their considerable mass, solitary behaviour, ornate faces with plates resembling those of the flanges of male orangutans, and fair-sized canine teeth seem behaviourally and morphologically consistent with both R and Monster Hunter's primates, to suggest this may be the case. 
But until we get a female Garen Golm or more lore on their social behaviour, this will remain just speculation. So for my thoughts on the two other Lords of Sunbreak, fairly mixed. For a start, I don't think their monstrous inspirations are all that fitting for a game like Monster Hunter, funnily enough. Werewolves and Frankenstein's monster are creatures that chiefly say things about humanity, and to turn them into super-powered animals ultimately loses all of that. The fact that Lunagaran stands on its hind legs is absolutely not enough to argue it becomes a man somehow. Monsters can still stand on their own two feet regardless of their inspiration, but it often helps if it's well-rooted. As for standing on their own two feet, Luna does so okay. Fight-wise, Luna is fine, but I also feel it suffers from the same problem I have with Gosarag, and that it feels like it only really gets going in its ice stage. The quadruped stage doesn't really feel like a proper fight, so much as it does just free damage with repetitive moves. So it's no surprise Luna spends more of its fight enraged, where it becomes generally more entertaining. But I'd rather have a better balance between the two phases. Design-wise, Luna is also okay. It's more lupine than Zenoga, but I'm not sure what exactly they were going for with the whole ice shark angle, which has always felt a bit tacked on to me. I'm also not the biggest fan of the scales, as they can make him look a bit like a robot at times too. And he also looks like a giant squirrel doing his pin attack. Overall, I think Luna is fine and has some fairly cool turf wars, but he's not really much more than a middle-of-the-road monster for me. Maybe Odogron has just set the bar too high for the more mammalian-adjacent fanged wyverns, but we'll have to see what Six offers. Garangolm, on the other hand, I struggle to feel much positivity for. Fight-wise, and lore-wise I guess too, it feels far too weak for how huge and strong it looks, and supposedly is meant to be. Most of the fight is spent using it as a punching bag, until it gets its nonsensical fire and water fists, and then spams its still pretty avoidable rocket jump endlessly. Overall, I felt it was a bit of a flop of a fight. Design-wise, it's also a bit all over the place, with its excessive shoulder pauldrons, weird hoofed hind feet, and unnecessary tail. Definitely feels like a lot of streamlining could go on there. I think Golm would work a lot better if they took more cues from actual apes, rather than whatever they were taking cues from to make him, and especially orangutans. Golm already seems to have similar flanges, and I think a fire and water primate monster could really work if it used tools in its environment to light weapons on fire or adorn them in water moss instead of just punching its fists into the ground. Orangutans especially are already wildly smart, and it'd be good to have a primate monster that feels like it embodies that trait that primates are perhaps best known for, rather than just feeling like a dumb brute like most of them really do in the series right now. Again, we'll have to see what 6th gen really delivers when it finally gets here. Thanks for watching, and thanks again to Top Patron Phenomenon for sponsoring this video themselves. Thanks too to the Super Stupa, Sam Burgo, Sunam Lobsong, Kay Sandum, Big Al, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Tristan Berry, Evilly, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fakelass Name, Zaser, Dodekablos, and Bazugazu Bachohatsu Bachomatsu for their ongoing kindness keeping things going. A link is provided in the description for any who would like to sign up, and any amount is always appreciated. Thanks too to Carmen Rider Moten for their digital artwork pieces and monster anatomy shots. For more original pieces not featured in the video, links are provided in the description to their assorted social media, so you can follow them there for more. And thanks to I Am The Kaiju King for the skulls of Luna Garen and Garangolm. For more skulls, more original creations, and more monster art pieces, be sure to follow him on Tumblr. And if you can, support them on Patreon too. Links to both are provided in the description. Thanks too for all the comments on Najarala from last time. There was some debate over Najar's jaws, and what they may be used for with some suggesting they may be better as cutting devices. Naja's feeding animation does have it biting and then seemingly pulling back to tear chunks off, though it's worth noting Naja's jaws don't seem very well suited to chew, with one huge tusk and then a beak in the front. If anything, the beak may be more suited to rip, like a vulture, and the feeding animation to an extent. But then Naja may need a better anchor to feed this way, or it could be this is the reason for its limbs still sticking around. 
to wedge it in place when feeding. Overall, having a snake try to feed like anything else is challenging. So this will be the last Monster Hunter video for 2023. There'll be another Spec Evo short before the year is out, and I think next time I'll cover something from a small indie film, and then we'll be done for the year. I'll be taking a break through the month of January, because since starting the channel I've been going fairly continuously, and in the name of transparency, YouTube just doesn't give you as much money in January either. But I will be working on a larger project also to start in February. It won't be quite the same as past content, and it isn't a rebrand, but will be more of a mini-series, with more typical content to resume afterwards. But more on next year's plans in the final video for 2023. Hopefully I'll see you there for it.